Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Radical Climate Justice for the Global Commons Nearly Carbon Neutral Conference hosted by the University of California at Santa Barbara. And welcome to our panel titled Collaborative Event Ethnography, Interdisciplinary Analysis of COP Meetings. So the annual Conference of Parties or COP meetings uh, are where UN member nations, uh, civil society, academia, and industry meet to set climate goals, determine policy, and discuss different climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. And they're working under the directorate of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. So the panelists and I will discuss some of the justice and equity issues uh, involved in the UNFCCC process based on our experiences attending COP meetings. We'll address lack of adaptation funding, false solutions, vaccine inequity, uh, as well as brain drains from LDCs among other topics. So let's start out with some introductions to our panelists. First, we have Dr. Simon Chin Yi, lecturer in University of College London's School of Public Policy. Next is Dr. Lauren Gifford, postdoctoral research associate at University of Arizona School of Geography, Development and Environment. And I'm Dr. Emily Height, an NSF funded uh, postdoctoral research fellow at Northern Arizona University. Lauren and I are also both visiting scholars at UCSB, uh, the Environmental Justice and Climate Justice Hub. So I'm so excited to be participating on this panel with the both of you, welcome. Let's begin by talking about uh, your roles in the UNF C process um, and your overall experiences attending these COP meetings. Uh, Simon, let's start with you. Thanks, Emily, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this uh, in this discussion. Um, in terms of the COPs and what I do there, what I've been doing there, mostly over the past eight, nine years, I've been mostly as an observer because I'm an academic, I'm a researcher. So my primary um, reason for being there is to wear that hat. But I have also been there in the capacity of a, of a, of a policy advisor to member states, as well as representing civil society groups, uh, writing for them, for example, during their time um, uh, in these conference of parties. Um, I find it really fascinating to understand the policy processes that are at play there. So that's what I'm kind of looking at, both the policy processes, how those rules, how those norms, how they play out in within the UNFCCC and the global climate regime, and then how they that applies to mostly states in the global south. Notably, I work on African countries mostly, but I've branched out a little bit to look at small island states and in countries in the Levant as well. So within that, it's a kind of looking at and trying to figure out how they fit into those processes. And if we're talking about climate justice later on, what that means for representation within the conference of parties. So I'll leave it there. Great, thanks. And how about you, Lauren? Um, so I have been following the COP process since about 2007 with the Bali COP. Um, the first one I attended was in Mexico, Cancun, I guess that was 2010. Um, and then I met Simon on a rooftop in Lima some at some point, I don't know what year that was, but the Lima COP. Um, I always come from a climate justice background. So everything I do is rooted in justice. When I started learning about the COP process, it was uh, as an employee of the Climate Justice Research Project at Dartmouth College. And we were really looking at what were then emerging carbon markets and looking at market mechanisms as um, tools for addressing climate change that actually have really unjust reverberations, unjust impacts, um, and, and looking at these complex mechanisms that a lot of people didn't and still don't understand how they work. Um, that's sort of become my life's work. So I like to look at how um, I'm particularly interested in carbon offsets, but I'm really interested in looking at how these financial mechanisms are discussed at the UN level, and then what happens when they trickle down and they're implemented on the ground and those disconnects in, in discourse and in action. Um, so I think the COP is a really important space to study, uh, particularly as critical social scientists interested in justice. Um, because this is where a lot of climate discourse um, is started, is driven. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, mitigation techni techniques are decided and honed in these spaces. Um, and then a real honor uh, for me was at the Paris COP. I was able to work with the government of Fiji. My family lives in Fiji. Um, I was able to work with the government of Fiji and help them uh, decide how they would like to negotiate the climate finance track of the Paris Agreement. And that was incredible. So. 
um, looking forward to Glasgow. Continue yeah, this work. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Um, my experience uh, at the COP meetings is um, I attended COP24 in Poland in 2018. And actually, I met Simon there through connections with Lauren. Um, and so I participated as an observer as well, uh, mostly doing um, discourse analysis kind of research for my dissertation, where I was focused on studying the intersection between indigenous rights and hydropower development. So I was really focused on attending panels um, that are that were you know based on those topics. And my area where I've been doing research is in Costa Rica. So I mostly focused on kind of those areas of the COPs. So um, it sounds like we have a, over about 10 years, a decade of experience attending COP meetings. So it's exciting to hear. And from I think all it's of pretty you. interesting. So you're an anthropologist, Simon's a political mm -hmm. scientist, I'm a geographer, human environment geographer. And uh, we're coming at it from really different spaces, but just hearing the three of us talk right now, we actually have very similar interests that are, you know, rooted in, in very similar questions and problems. Yeah, I think there's a lot of overlap. So, so much overlap, and actually it's really interesting, we all look at kind of vulnerable populations, right, but in different kind of contexts, and within that, within these UNFCCC processes, that's what I'm look at, looking at, and that's what I'm most interesting, interested in, seeing where, what that means, what countries are ignoring the science, which countries are uh, trying to block certain advancements in moving forward on anything. And then what does this mean for those indigenous communities? What do, those voices, where do they, where do, where, where are they found within the COP buses? They're getting louder, but where are they? And, uh, and so I find this absolutely fascinating to see how, how these things work. And unfortunately, how sometimes policy processes get diluted down. And Simon, I see your book behind you, the, the coalitions and the climate talks. Is that is that the right topic of, or it's the title? What's the title of your book? The, uh, the title of the book is Coalitions and the Climate Change Negotiations. It came out earlier this year right. and it literally breaks down uh, in eight chapters or 10 chapters, different types of coalitions that exist within the climate negotiations. And uh, it's the first book out of its kind. And, and I think it's so important because these coalitions are really interesting, right? You have these small countries that don't have a lot of capacity capacity um, for, you know, sending large delegations, large prepared delegations to the COP. Um, and, and coalitions allow for capacity building, resource sharing, um, and, and it's, a, it's a big way to combat justice uh, at the COP or, or you know, bring, sm say, small island states uh, or, you know, I think you, you particularly, Simon, study African, the African coalitions. Um, to sort of make one louder voice that can compete with these large, wealthy Western countries that, that seem to be the loudest at the COP too often. Yeah, this is, I mean, that the, literally the chapter of the, uh, the uh, name of the chapter I wrote is One Voice, One Africa. And it's just looking at how 55 countries can come to the table with a stronger voice because there is strength in numbers. Now, that is not to say that they're still not negated by larger or more powerful countries or blocks, such as the European uh, Union, for example, the US, China, this still is playing out. We see it happening time and again within these within the COP processes. Lauren, you and I were at COP21. At the very last minute, what we thought was going, what might happen in South Africa was going to ruffle things up and change something. They didn't. The UNFCCC Secretariat on the behest of the United States changed a, a specific word from uh, shall to should 15 minutes before it was adopted. And uh, although it had been six years of work to put this together, I was in the room and I just felt let down because yet again, the Africa group, for example, were negated in the process. Years and millions and millions of dollars and resources and energy comes down to lengthy debates between should and shall. And that was maddening. Yeah. This is really interesting. I mean, you're talking so much about the different power structures that are involved in making these kind of decisions and policies. And so, you know, you've, we've been working on these issues for a decade, but the international community has been working on trying to solve the climate crisis or address climate change for well over a quarter of a century. Um, you know, using this very specific UNFCCC process that's based on capitalist systems, um, market-based, you know, dynamics. So, you know, 
However, what we know, of course, now the latest IPCC report just came out in August. Um, it's very clear that climate change is still a problem. Um, and it's not just something in the future, it's happening now, it's happening in all of our backyards um, with fires and droughts and floods and things like that that we've seen over, you know, increase over the past year even. Um, so this really, you know, kind of begs the question then, is this current governance system working? Um, you know, you were kind of mentioning some of these power structural issues, but, you know, also, can you talk about maybe some of the aspects that do work? Um, and others that maybe really need to be improved that you can identify. Um, Lauren, can I, can I jump yeah, in? I know sure. Simon's itching too, but <laughs> I just wanna say as a, a critical development geographer, we know that a lot of times these development, um, development interventions, development um, you know, mechanisms, organizations, they don't work, right? They don't meet the needs that they've set out to met, meet. But in that, failure in that lack of success, they succeed in doing something else. And this is why I think we need critical scholars to be studying the COP process. What, what is the COP successful at doing? And that does not mean mitigating climate change. Like obviously we've, we've continued to struggle to understand how to mitigate and how to fund adaptation to climate change through this process. Um, but, but what comes out of it? And I think we really need to be asking these questions and Simon might as the political scientist might be able to weigh in here. Um, but I think it's important to say, what is this process doing? Why has it been happening for a quarter of a century? Um, why are countries continued to be so invested in something that has non-binding, you know, that, that just, that leads to very complex non-binding commitments? Um, I think all of these questions are really interesting and important. Simon, go ahead. So yeah, as a political scientist, to start on like on the downside of things, I guess, is that when we're looking at these multinational, multilateral uh, environmental agreements, we have to figure out what did we mean by if we're achieving the objectives that are set out in these in the agreements? Why are how are we measuring success? Right. So the first thing that we need to remind everyone is that you measure success if they achieve the objective they set out, not just because everyone's participating or not. Right. So if it's if you if you look at success and this is why this cop this year is particularly important because we were looking at ratcheting up ambition since paris six years ago this was supposed to happen last year so now that we're measuring we're supposed to be keeping global temperatures down to 1.5 degrees if we haven't reached that then we haven't achieved the objectives as set out in the agreement right but why is that is it because a we don't have the right players at the table or b that the ambitions are not working uh, they're not high enough so even though in terms of a success and why people are still very invested in, well, I, I'm very hopeful that countries are invested in climate change negotiations because they recognize the importance of addressing this, even though it's been three decades that we've been talking about this. On the same time, there is ways and scope to learn from past mistakes. Paris learned from Kyoto, right? We learned something there, we learned and we did, and, and the, uh, the French government with all of the other governments, obviously, but the French presidency in COP21 put something forward that was a, uh, a bottom-up approach to tackling climate change, as opposed to Kyoto, which was a top-down approach to tackling climate change. You go away, you, uh, you need to achieve this degree of, of warning or limit this degree of warning. I apologize for the street outside. There's a lot of traffic. Um, you, anyway, so the, the, in Kyoto, the, the, uh, the, the, you basically, the, the UNFCCC said to member states, you go away, developed only member states, and then you come back and achieve this. They didn't. And so with Paris, they're like, no, no, no. Everyone, every one of you, all 196 countries, you now go away, you come up and you tell us what you can do with the uh, with the with the possibility or that you're going to then move and increase ambition and in that way we'll tackle it. Now we're nowhere near tackling it at the moment, so we're still not there, but there is, there is hope that even though the UNFCCC and these agreements and these mechanisms are all based on this notion of consensus, which is sometimes seen as sort of a race to the bottom situation when you have to base the final version of whatever text or agreements on uh, the lowest common denominator. Saying that, we have achieved things over the past, uh, since two, 2009 or 2000. Or 2000. Um, so I'm, there is hopeful that we can, we can increase that ambition, but it, that's why it's really important. 
this COP, this particular COP to see how if states actually do that. I like what Simon said about how like it hasn't been successful in that we have not limited climate change to 1.5 degrees. I mean, I think that's a really, really simple way of thinking about it. An important way to think about it. Yeah, and I think, you know, what both of you said is just so interesting. I mean, kind of like, how do we measure success is such an interesting way to put it too. Um, but, you know, one thing that I was thinking about is, um, you know, there's one thing that does work, it really is good at coalition building and creating these networks of all these different people that from around the world that are able to attend these conferences. Um, you know, and one thing going for the first time, it's 20 to 30,000 people in these massive, you know, convention centers. Uh, it is very difficult to navigate the space. I think there's a lot of different kind of control issues of where certain people with certain accreditation are allowed to go. Um, so I think there's some challenges in that. We were all talking before we started just about like, we're pretty well networked, but it's kind of challenging to even get accredited to be able to attend. Um, you know, and one thing I found was that the um, observers, two thirds of the observer states are from North America and Europe. So that's, you know, really kind of unequal balance of power of who's even able to make it into these conferences. And then since 2009 or so, I think, um, protest marches started with like all the other folks who can't have their voices heard inside or all kind of gathering on the outside. So there's definitely just, you know, this balance of who can participate um, and have their voices heard inside the conference space that I think is really important, kind of a challenge, but yet so many voices are being heard. And I think Simon mentioned in the beginning, you know, increased platforms for indigenous communities and people from different countries are able to attend. Um, so I think that is, yeah, Simon, do you wanna add on to that? Just if we go back to that question of representation, actually, Emily started by speaking about this uh, at the beginning, and it's about power. It's about power and knowledge. It's about those dynamics. So it's understanding who is there, who's representing whom, where, uh, where those people are in the terms of just working on climate change in their own countries. And we're talking about member states here. I'm not even talking about movements and civil society groups. I'm just talking about member states. It, as interesting, as important as looking at a group like the Africa group is and what power means for knowledge. And there's where I'm a little bit hopeful as well, because we have for once a UN uh, regime that is supposed to, supposed to, be based around knowledge, around science. That's how this whole thing started, unlike all of the other neoliberal institutions that we have. But then if we see how those, power, uh, those powers uh, are playing out within the negotiations, as great as it is for 55 African countries to have a, a, a bigger voice through that one, what if there's only nine to 10 people that are actually working on those negotiations? Are nine to 10 people representing 1.2 billion? That's what's happening. Yeah, it's quite a challenge. And I think this kind of goes into our next question then, just thinking about um, how do we actually effectively address those challenges in the parts of the governance system of the UNF C process that aren't working? Lauren, you know, do you want to start? Yeah, I think, um, and I've been talking about this a lot lately in, in other sort of media spots and things like that, which is, you know, you have these non-binding commitments that haven't been met by very wide margins. Um, and, and, but we need to think of climate change. Climate change is a wicked problem, right? It, it impacts every part of our world, right? This is the whole concept of the Anthropocene that humans have irreversibly altered all of life systems because of, you know, extracting and combusting fossil fuels. And um, I think that we can't just put all of our attention on multilateral government level, UN level, climate negotiations, right? A lot of the really progressive um, uh, climate action has been happening at local level, state level, country level. Um, it's been happening through um, private companies, a lot of greenwashing in private companies as well. But um, I think we need to accept the, the UN level for, for what it is, um, continue to critique it. Obviously that's my, that's my favorite thing to say. Um, but also maybe see, it can't be all things to all people. This is not the only way that we are addressing climate change. Um, it's flawed, but also it keeps climate in the global discourse. Uh, if you look at the way media, I'm part of a team at CU that tracks 
um, media mentions of, of climate change and global warming. And every time there's a COP, uh, you know, it spikes in the news, right? It continues, keep, keeps us talking about it um, in the media and social spheres and things like that. Um, it, it holds, holds countries feet to the feet to the fire a little bit. Like, what are you doing to meet the Paris Agreement? What are you doing um, in these spaces? So anyway, I, I think, um, and I can't even remember the initial question, uh, but I do think it's a conversation that is worth, you know, continuing to have. Yeah, and I'll just add in, you know, just thinking about like how to effectively address the issues of governance that aren't really working. And I think, yeah, just talking about, you know, we have to accept the UN process for what it is, but there's so many other um, ways to support effective climate solutions, really. So, um, Simon, do you want to add to that? I just agree with everything you're saying. It's just that I think the other thing we have to look at is what's happening. It's all well and good to see what's happening at that global level, but afterwards, countries go back home. So what are they going to do then? What are they doing? We've seen rich countries just negate on, on their promises with all the best, beautiful, flourishing words in the world. Then they go back and they buy pipelines, right? Um, it's looking forward, it's understanding. And we're going to really kind of see this this year as well because of COVID-19 and what that means for representation at these COPs, but also what that means for action on the ground. How much are countries and people desperately trying to go back to the way things were. And if something that can be learned, and I guess we'll see in November, is that we've seen governments pivot and with varying degrees of success, address a global climate challenge. Now, if they can recognize that this climate crisis has been a global climate challenge and crisis for uh, many, many decades now, that were, then, and, and, and address it accordingly, then maybe we'll get somewhere. What do you think, Emily? Um, I was thinking a little more on a pessimistic side in the sense that, you know, the UNFCCC is promoting certain false solutions. Um, there's, you know, what I focus on is our dams and hydropower, and that's being promoted now as a climate mitigation solution from the top down, kind of an umbrella way to get clean energy, sustainability, um, you know, provide for communities. And I think that's really dangerous to just put the, that out as a platform. You know, it was promoted under Kyoto as a clean development mechanism, and there's a massive growth in hydropower since then. Um, but there's, you know, massive social, cultural, um, ecological impacts. But also, you know, the science has shown over the past few decades that um, reservoirs, especially in tropical areas where dams are increasingly being built, um, they actually give off a lot of methane. They're, you know, high greenhouse gas emitters. And so they're really not a, a solution to climate mitigation. Um, they have, you know, very similar output to fossil fuel, coal fired plants and things like that. So, so I think there's some kind of this like balance where, you know, the UNF triple C can really be a leader in a sense and, you know, build coalitions and set some really great goals. Um, but then some of those, methods that they're promoting, I think actually really need to be analyzed at the local level of whether or not that can fit the local needs of uh, the region, so. Yeah, and this is a full conversation for another time, but there's mm -hmm. a reason why the activist community calls it the conference of polluters, you know. So I think we'll wrap up with one kind of final question that can go kind of in any direction, but I'm really curious, you know, we're all talking about planning to go to the next COP coming up in November. Um, you know, thinking about all these different kind of justice issues that are involved in these other challenges. Um, what can we really expect to see in Glasgow in November? You know, there's vaccine issues um, in terms of equity and other things because of COVID as well. So Simon, do you, can you start with that? What we are going to see or what I would like to see? <laughs> what we are going to see, I am very afraid, is a, a little bit more of the same. A lot of rhetoric, a lot of dilly dallying around commas, still not being able to finalize the Paris rule book that's been in, in finalization for six years. You know, um, 
that's what I fear that we're going to see is that there's going to be a lot of talk and there's going to be, and a lot of developing countries are just not going to be adequately represented at this conference of parties. What I would like to see is real ambition being made forward. What I'd like to see is these new nationally determined contributions that states were supposed to have put in, and I had a look and not many of them have, um, uh, these new ones, the second round, do ratchet up ambition so that if we're going to keep talking about 1.5 degrees that we mean it like that they mean it you know within that and within that it's just as emily you said earlier the sixth assessment ipcc assessment came out two months ago or a month ago um i'd like to see that at the heart of the negotiations i would like to see that being really taken on board because the last time we had a report come out in 2018 it was blocked by four countries um, so I'd like to see, I'd like to see those things. And the final thing is I want to, I want to see the money. I want to see the finance. Where's the money we've been promised for up 12 years now. Where is it? It's not there. Where's the hundred billion. I want to see that. I got to tack it on to Simon too. Another activist thing that we hear is WTF. Where's the finance? Um, countries need money, right? This is the idea of the green new deal. This is the idea of the green climate fund. We countries need money to adapt, to mitigate climate change and to adapt to climate change. Um, I hope we actually see it and I'm not hopeful that we will. I'd like to add on, yeah, I just, I, I'm very hopeful. Um, I would like to see the goals of net zero not be put off until 2050, 2060, but kind of 2030 at the latest, um, they need to be worked on immediately. So I just wanna thank you both so much. I think this was a really great conversation. So wonderful to chat with you and hear about your expertise at the UNFCCC processes. Um, and I just wanna to say to the audience, thank you all so much for participating. Please feel free to log in, ask us some questions and we'll be able to provide feedback and continue chatting with you throughout uh, the conference. Yes, I was gonna say, look underneath it. There will, there's a place to comment on this. Um, on this uh, video, please do. We will monitor, we will engage with you. Uh, and thanks for participating in the UCSB Nearly Neutral Climate Conference because this is one of the best conferences, I think. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's been really fun to participate in, and it's in these really important discussions, especially coming in the next couple of months moving forward. Thank you.